a day indeed, Ayanda. A hive of activity that we're also experiencing here at uh, the upper level of the Results Operation Centre here in Madrid. And I guess, uh, as you've eloquently put it, you know, it's been a very intriguing day for many South Africans as we've been witnessing uh, the uh, voting uh, activity across the country. I myself had a very pleasant experience, I must say. So uh, that really does uh, help contextualise much of what it is that we will be discussing throughout this uh, elections on Kaya special. And I've got my good and faithful colleague with me, Pimelo Mutene. Always a delight to work with you. What a day, what a day. Right? Welcome to all of you who've just joined us. This is going to be our special broadcast and we're going to be doing this hopefully until Sunday. Yes. The IEC has said that they will give us those results uh, on Sunday, so we look forward to that. But as Ayanda said, it's still quiet here, mm -hmm. but you can start hearing the buzzing. The buzzing is starting to happen uh, uh, below us here where the actual leaderboard is. Right. And there will be a cross, we'll cross uh, straight to the IEC um, a briefing at 7 o'clock sharp. Mm -hmm. That will be happening while we are on air. You and I are going to be doing this until 10 tonight. Yes. So it's going to be quite busy, lots of analysis, not only political, also business. Yeah, definitely some business updates as well. It was very clear last night as we spoke to several business representatives that business does have a vested interest as to how the politics of Absolutely. the day do influence the environment. And whilst it's not so much about the political parties, it does speak to the policies because fundamentally that does play an influence on the certainty that they see. But briefly on that, I, I thought I must tell you, the markets have been closed today, but the currencies have actually been incredibly steady despite mm -hmm. the ongoing trade that does take place there. So for anyone who is concerned about the RAND and typically the comments that have been said in the past that when it drops, we'll pick it up. <laughs> we all know it doesn't work that way. If it did, we'd be in a much more fortunate position as South Africans. But still trading at 1830 to the US dollar, 2335 to the British pound and uh, 1987 against the euro. Company updates as well. We see the likes of Anglo and BHP. They've been in the headlines for quite some yes. time as BHP has been wanting to pick up the assets that are owned by Anglo-American. When is that deadline? Today. Today. And it doesn't seem... So it will come from, from the London Stock Exchange, It will right? come from the London Stock Exchange, but from what we understand, Anglo-American isn't looking to offer an extension on that particular deal. So that will be intriguing to see uh, how it does transpire in, in the South African environment. But might come as a, some welcome relief for many key stakeholders in mining in South Africa. So we obviously, as I said, we're going to be having conversations with analysts. We're going to be having conversations with political leaders. I know one yeah. already is here, Musi Maimane. Uh, we saw walk into the center and uh, will be speaking to me in this hour. We'll also be crossing back to our colleague who's going to be watching that leaderboard. Of course, as we sit, it's zero, zero, zero. Mm -hmm. um, that's across the board until nine o'clock when those results start trickling in. We hope anyway. Um, we know that some um, results uh, will be coming in only after the last station is closed. So, yes, 9 o'clock is the time, Yes, but no one's going to be turned away. 100%. That's the most important part. No one's going to be turned away. So, when they say it's done and they've closed, then we'll start seeing them trickle in and it's going to be really exciting from that point onwards. What I find so intriguing, uh, Pimelo, about this is the fact that I've been seeing a lot of tweets and social media updates and even our colleague, Katie Katapodis, is yeah. still stuck in a queue two hours after uh, uh, being there. So, it does yeah. seem as though there's a slightly heightened level of uh, voter turnout yeah. uh, in this election uh, and likely that we will see polling stations perhaps keeping their doors open for longer. So, traditionally, um, the, the, the biggest traffic is between 7 and 11. And the IEC has said possibly going to be between 7 and 12 because mm -hmm. of the three ballots. But we are seeing, I think the IEC is going to tell us when they tell us uh, during that press briefing, that probably, you know, we saw more people come out than maybe expected. Mm -hmm. And you never know with these things. Everybody's saying it's still early days. It's still early to say what the voter turnout was like. But when we look at um, what we saw just from the naked eye, yeah. it's, it's going to be interesting. Look, we have to factor other things in. Um, Ayanda spoke about the new system that is in place. There were delays and other people stood in the queues for longer. So, so maybe that's a result of the fact that people were in queues for longer, not that there were more people. Who knows? But we'll obviously start getting that update um, as those results trickle in. But really exciting times. We do have an analyst in studio with us. I'm excited. Someone who's well esteemed and well informed around uh, the uh, events of political activity in South Africa, right? Yep. Uh, uh, and, and has followed up with many of the regulations and potential changes that should take yep. place. Well, Michael Atkins is an independent election analyst uh, who is in studio with us. Thank you. Really appreciate you coming in, Mike. Um, welcome. Welcome to Kaya. This is that short period where no news is good news. Yes, 
It is. And we're all smiling at the moment. I think tomorrow we'll start hearing some really heated debates and political parties starting to say things that sometimes can sound outrageous. But we're in the calm now. And so we have enough time to analyze what we think is going to happen. But before we get there, Mike, I mean, you've been involved and observed a lot of the, the policies that have got us here. A lot of people saying that, look, this is going to be an election that is a watershed a kind of election. And that's because there are many changes with this particular election and how we are voting, some of the things that have changed. And you've been watching that quite closely, how we got here. Yes. Uh, as we know that uh, independent candidates may participate in the elections for the first time. From my own point of view, I've been surprised that we don't have more that are participating. Uh, I guess we'll see how it pans out before more people throw their hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. And and I want us to talk about that because I I saw a few of them going out to vote today and really just saying, you know, what a a moment it is. And I also saw and heard a lot of people say, look, I loved candidate X, candidate Y, but I don't know. I feel like it's going to be a waste of my vote. And, And there is a bit of that sense where people are saying, we love candidate X, candidate Y, but in the greater pool, it may not mean anything. That's because of the way in which the legislation has been structured. You know, some people play the numbers games and play the power games and are only interested in who, who is the most powerful. I take the view that Parliament is representative of the whole nation. Yeah. And having independent candidates gives us more people in Parliament And a lot of the work is in committees and and behind the scenes and being able to extend representation to different groups of people, to my mind, enriches the democratic environment. Mm. And that is always going to be a good thing. Mm. Obviously, one of the issues that people are raising is that threshold of what it is that gets you into Mm. Parliament, how many numbers are going to get an individual into Parliament. It was something that was contentious. A civil society took that to court. So let's talk about that and how we eventually got here. This, uh, the Electoral Amendment Act, in a way was rushed, there were a lot of consultations, it was a long process, but one of the consequences, it's just the way the numbers worked, is that independent candidates for the National Assembly require effectively nearly twice as many votes to guarantee a seat as do parties. Now, yes, it was fought in in the Constitutional Court, I was closely involved in that, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of reasons the case was rushed there, there's a lot of factors that played a role it was heard urgently so it has been disappointing that that high barrier still remains for independent candidates but basically well done to those who have stuck it out and 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 stuck their neck out to to participate so let, let's talk about the threshold the threshold for an independent candidate was was so what it is is uh, if you work out within each province or region as they term it uh, there are 200 seats spread among the regions for those uh, calculations and because there's only 200 seats take, uh, taking part as it were in the calculations uh, independent candidates require for the different provinces based on the 2019 results would, would have required between 68 and 92,000 votes to guarantee a seat, whereas political parties are guaranteed a seat. The quota there is uh, sitting, was Forty-ish. it 44,000? Which, on the surface, is not fair, right? Mm. So, so they would require less mm. than an independent candidate would require. So when you work it out, if they get, let's say, 90,000, that kind of, in a way, guarantees them two seats in Parliament as opposed to an independent candidate. No, absolutely. And the way the seat allocations work when there are leftover seats that get allocated, parties get their second seat with 50,000 votes or, or more. It's just a, a peculiar way the, 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 the extra seats are allocated. So, yes, 
it is actually quite a high uh, mountain for independence to climb. Quite a high threshold, yeah. On that note, though, Michael, then uh, what is it that you'll be looking out for when it comes to the uh, results and the outcomes of the numbers, when it comes to the performance of independent candidates, uh, given what you've described? Well, having been close to the, the, the court case, I will be interested in an independent candidate who potentially would get, say, 58,000 votes mm. and just miss out on one of the remainder seats in their regional calculation, mm -hmm. whereas a political party with effectively 55,000, it's more complicated because we'll there's two ballots. But if we compare with the old system, effectively 55,000 votes could well May get, get two. two seats. Ooh. And so maybe we may see if if maybe two or three independent candidates find themselves in this scenario, they may get go back to court. The constitutional lawyers would say what the avenues are to reopen a, a constitutional court yeah. decision. I, I don't know. But it, it would certainly raise questions of fairness. And when you come down to it, Free and fair elections is one of the fundamental constitutional values. Mm. I'm assuming that this is quite telling then of, of, of the uh, mood around and the sentiment around these elections this year, that it has become a lot more competitive. Many more South Africans do want to make a difference. And I'm keen, uh, following your observations over the years, what are the key nuances or differentiating factors about this year's elections that you're witnessing so far? Well, We've had over the years, as, as we all know, like for the National Assembly, a general increase in the number of parties participating. The growth was not high from 48 to 52 on the National Assembly ballot. But what was interesting is a lot of parties who took part in the previous elections dropped away. Mm. Half of those 52 parties are completely new entrants. Mm. So of those new entrants, there's a few different categories. Some are people who have a history with other parties. Uh, some are smaller parties. And then there are some parties with quite solid uh, structures and on the ground presence. Yep. So the, it will be very interesting to see how the balance of vo votes goes among those new entrants. We've heard uh, our colleague Ayanda speak about the, the technology that has been uh, you know, introduced in this particular election. Um, some, I heard one of the independent candidates saying, well, we complained from the onset that the IEC's technology is not up to scratch. We were disqualified to participate um, provincially because we, we complained about the technology. Today, that technology issue is coming up again. Um, the VMD system that others are saying is part of the reason why there were delays, is part of the reason why there were glitches. In fact, um, uh, former president of Nigeria, Basanjo, actually himself made mention of that, saying, look, it's all very good, but he is concerned about some of the delays caused by the technical glitches. Mm. You know, those VMDs are a great system, you know, the, and the IEC has worked very hard and have brought in good, good technology in that sense. So they are a positive development. Obviously, it's really tough when you go out into a live environment with technology. Mm. So I'm sympathetic yeah. to the fact that there can be glitches. I, I, I'm a numbers person. So I want to start asking questions. How many? Mm. How long were the delays? Ah. You know, I, I want somebody to gather all of those and not just have little anecdotal stories yeah. which then drift away after a while. The IEC has said the average delay has been two hours. Well, obviously here at 7 o'clock, you mm -hmm. know, whether they're going to revise that, that kind of uh, number. But that's what they're saying. They're saying the delay has been about two hours. Well, we'll also touch base with a few of our colleagues who we understand have been in a few queues for longer than two hours. But touching on the glitch and perhaps even coming back to an earlier tweet that you might have highlighted around the concerns uh, around um, rigging is impossible, which was mentioned by the IEC. And you're saying, hold on, uh, rigging and electoral fraud, we actually need to interrogate how some of these things might play in influence and understanding some of the risks that are that are posed there. Uh, contextualize this for us, uh, especially with, in terms of the positioning of the IEC and what we could potentially hear this evening that could speak to potential rigging or electoral fraud. Yes, people use these terms very loosely. Mm. Rigging is when there is a centralized effort to just alter the numbers on the computer. Just turn around and say, no, here's a million extra votes 
Or, for example, there have been stories in places like Zimbabwe of ghost entries on the voters' roll, and that's been statistically proven. Mm. So those things are effectively impossible here. We do have enough checks and balances. Anybody can take the results from a voting station and compare it to the published results. (laughs) So it, it really wouldn't be possible to change the numbers centrally. Mm -hmm. However, as anywhere in the world, there are going to be over-enthusiastic people at at a local level Mm. who who are part of the process, Mm -hmm. who want to alter the outcome. And there are lots of little and some slightly bigger tricks that can be used. So, for example, when they count the votes into piles of ten, you can count one party's uh, votes in piles of nine and call it ten, And another party can be counted in piles of 11 and call it 10. Mm -hmm. So there are many of these. So the question is, electoral fraud which happens anywhere, and even perhaps just some errors that occur, human error, it's a huge exercise that we're having. The question is, are we sufficiently protected against electoral fraud and do we have the make well we have the framework in place Mm. to deal with it we Mm -hmm. definitely do there's an objection mechanism we've got the electoral court they've been very busy of late but you know we do have the things but party agents how many parties can deploy party agents Mm. in every voting station we've had an increase in independent observers in this election Mm -hmm. So, uh, Groundwork Collective, we're deploying, I extend to correction, but 3,000 or so observers, which is a fantastic effort. Mm -hmm. But we have 23,000 voting stations. Sure. Quite a bit. Uh, there, there's a lot we're going to get through tonight, and, and I, I'd be really intrigued to see, you know, uh, as we head into Sunday, some of the key themes that you 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 will be uh, paying attention to. And Pimelo, perhaps this also speaks to, you know, uh, some closing thoughts that we can get uh, before we, we um, uh, wrap up with Mr. Atkins. What else were you looking, you know, at with interest, uh, mm-hmm. Michael? I mean, you, you look at quite a, a plethora of issues when it comes to elections, but just maybe something that you haven't touched on yet. Well, uh, as I said, I'm a numbers person. Yeah. So something I've done as, as an interest over a number of years is you look at the numbers in each voting station. Mm-hmm. So, for example, and I know we have, because of the new electoral law, we have new systems in place. I'll be watching very carefully. But in the past, there have been discrepancies between the numbers of votes cast mm-hmm. in provincial elections and in national. Mm. Now, that yes. can't happen. Yeah. They watch you put both your ballot papers or now all three At ballot papers time. in the box. Yeah. And whether it's spoilt or not, it's, there shouldn't be a difference in the numbers of, of votes cast. And yet it, it does happen. Yeah. So that is one thing I will be watching. The IEC have improved their, rec- their recording of results. Mm-hmm. They've skipped out one of the steps where in writing down of numbers because they used to write in a diary then transfer to the forms Mm. and then send those forms for capture. And my understanding is that they've cut out one of those steps. And anything where people write things down is a place where mistakes can <laughs> Human be error comes in. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up, but one of the things he's touched on is, um, you know, issues of the spoiled ballot. We'll talk to that at some point, but we've got a couple of days now to deal with that. So let me thank you very much, uh, Michael Atkins, for making time for us and for really helping us understand some of the really key issues as we look into this election. He's an independent elections analyst and, uh, wow, a lot to think about there. Right? Certainly a lot to think about, and I guess in the upcoming days when we hear these updates from the IEC, we will be following up on many of these points uh, and seeking more clarity on them. Well, uh, Pimelo, as mentioned, we've got a vibrant team that's on the ground with us here at uh, the Results Operating Centre. And Ayanda Nyati is standing by with us as well to give us further insights uh, on updates that we can hear on the ground and actually hearing from uh, the General Manager for Electoral Operations, uh, Granville Abrahams, to give us some more perspective. Ayanda?